Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Reverend Dr. Keith Garner. As we turn to God's Word, let us pray. We pray that you will give us the wisdom of the Spirit, the inspiration of your presence, and that insight which comes from walking with Jesus to so understand your truth as we hear it this night and as we live it day by day and all for the praise of Christ. Amen. As you join us here in the Wesley Theatre in Sydney, I want to talk about glory. Glory that is either fleeting or enduring. Two very different kinds of presence. Doxa is glory, right from the Old Testament truth. It is that presence of God that when we stand in it, we find ourselves somehow changed by it. But is it something that is fleeting? Something that perhaps uh, comes a part of our life, it's, it's, it's there for a moment, or is it something that endures? We turn to Luke chapter 9, 28 through 36. And on this second Sunday of Lent, I've chosen to talk about the transfiguration of Jesus. In some ways, it could be said to be one of the most difficult passages in the whole of the New Testament, if not the Bible. I know you'll find that there are are difficult uh, commandments or parts of law, but I think in terms of understanding, this really is up there with the best. It really has a challenge for all of us. We discover characters from the Old Testament suddenly translated into the New. Uh, We have to handle complexity. It's been thought so uh, so complex by some people that perhaps it is a resurrection account written back into the Gospels. It's visionary in content, and hence its language becomes very subjective whenever we talk about that which is visionary. Difficult for us to really imagine or grasp ourselves. To help my own understanding of what it has to say, I link it to Paul's very practical words about the implications of reflecting the glory of God in our own lives. I'll return to that in just a moment. But first of all, let me tell you, my wife and I went to the entertainment center on Valentine's Day to hear Carol King in concert. For those who don't know who she is, you'll have a word with me afterwards and I'll, I'll ex- explain. Before the concert, we walked around uh, the harbour there after having some coffee and noticed lots of young men carrying roses. Now, whoever had been selling it was on to a winner that night. Though, of course, it could have been the other way had the rain of this weekend happened then. And uh, it reminded me of the story of a very inattentive workaholic husband who suddenly decided to surprise his wife with a night to remember. He went to the department store. He had noticed when they'd been shopping that she admired a dress in particular. So he bought it. He knew her size. We thought he did anyway. He bought an extra large bottle of perfume He ordered tickets for a play that he'd heard her talk about on numerous occasions and wanted to see for some time. And he bought two dozen red roses and carried them home under his arm. On arriving home, he exploded through the door, hugged his wife affectionately and told her, I just want you to know how much I love you, I appreciate you, I adore you. Instead of melting into her husband's arms, his wife started screaming at the top of her voice. This has been the worst day of my life. It was awful at the office. We lost our biggest account. My colleagues have been obnoxious. The clients have been totally unreasonable. I came home to find the kids had broken my favorite lamp. The babysitter is quitting. The water heater is broken. And now, surprise of all things, my husband, who's normally calm, comes home drunk. The reality is in life, we struggle with surprises. We struggle with things that we really have no hold over, that invade our lives and in doing so, call for a response from us. We're a little bit circumspect about surprises. If things seem to be too good, then generally they are. We even feel that way about religion. 
Many of us in our own tradition like things to be in the same place with a certain decency and order and decorum that pulls it together. So when the Bible talks about glowing garments and transfiguration and visitors who are supposed to be dead, alive, I'm not surprised people are cautious. What's going on here? Would someone explain it to us and say something of what it has to say to our living and how we make our journey with Jesus Christ? Are we willing to let ourselves be engulfed in mystery? Or is mystery something other people go for and we don't entertain? Are we prepared to be inspired by glory, transformed by encounters of the divine kind? That's what the transfiguration of Jesus is all about. Let me take you a little closer and ask whether the glory we see is fleeting, only here for a moment or two, or the kind that's enduring, that will outlast all of time. Recently, I had to renew my driving license, and as I looked at the photo, that thought came to mind. If you actually look like the photo on your passport or your driving license, you ought not to be traveling or driving. You see, our faces tell a story. Many, many faces tell stories. I know people who have been through ordeals that are reflected in their faces. I think of the the, the woman whose husband was in prison. And I used to take to the railway station so that she could travel hundreds of miles to visit him. She was a very, very decent woman. And her husband put his hand into the office lawyer's account. Then I think of the person whose children had deserted her. Not that the parents had deserted the children, but the children, as soon as they got to the stage where they could leave home and abandon the family, they did. It was written all over her face. And I can think of the wife whose husband was violent to her. Sometimes, unfortunately, she carried the marks of his violence on her face. But even if there were no marks, there was something desperately wrong. On this Sunday, I refer to three scriptures. Firstly, I I have in mind the Old Testament account of Moses coming down the, the mount at Sinai with tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments in each arm. The people didn't notice the commandments because they were captivated by his face. There was something about Moses when he had been in the presence of God that so transformed him that it issued forth in a physical expression. We're told that Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone because he'd been talking with God. And then in 2 Corinthians... Paul takes that Old Testament story and and begins to expound it and develop it in a most helpful way and refers to the fact that Moses wore a veil over his face because people were afraid to look at him. He goes on to say that we don't have our faces covered and continues. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Friedrich Nietzsche was a great critic of the Christian faith. He said Christians ought to look more like they were redeemed. What many people don't know about Nietzsche is, of course, that he was brought up in the home of a Lutheran pastor. The church attendance and and, and, and dealing with the, the things of God were the bread and butter of his life. Perhaps he had many times realized that the faces of the church people he met didn't really reflect the glory of God. So when he says church people should look more like they're redeemed, it has a context. And this passage in chapter 9 of Luke is often considered just before Ash Wednesday in the the calendars and lectionaries of the world. But it has a place in Lent too, as we journey to the cross. 
Peter, James, and John are with Jesus on the mountainside. As he prays, his face is transfigured. We've come to use that term, the transfiguration. It's a glimpse into what the future holds. People talk about its, its relationship to sufferings. Others talk about its relationship to future glory. But it's certainly a profound moment. It acts in some ways as a confirmation to those disciples that he really is the Christ, the Son of God. A number of things about this passage. First of all, this is the glory of what God is like. You see, the disciples find themselves not only in the presence of Jesus, but of the two most significant characters of the whole of the Old Testament. One, of course, Moses represents the great lawgiver, the giant of the Old Testament, whom God uses to bring the law to his people. And then, of course, Elijah, often considered the senior of the prophets. And so in that place, there is far more than simply a meeting. Luke doesn't tell us how the face of Jesus changed. If you're really interested in those deep and questions like, how did it happen? One day you'll have your opportunity to ask. But not tonight, nor tomorrow morning. Some things belong to the glory and majesty and mystery of God. And I'm grateful for that. I get very worried when, when faith becomes a cerebral thing and, and somehow we have it all worked out in such a way that says, oh, we know how it happened. We don't, but we know something profound did happen. The luminous transparency somehow of the presence of God. And, the, and I can't help but thinking, and will do when we come to the other side of Easter, there, there's something about the presence of Jesus after Easter, so much so they didn't recognize him. Come on, if, it's okay saying it's simply because of their tears. Look, it's so important to recognize. Look, he walked with them. And, and absolutely, it's the case that they were so captivated by their own despair and pain and suffering, but they didn't see him. There was clearly something about the presence of Jesus that was different. And I think we get worried about that because we think when we say it's different, that it isn't resurrection. Well, of course it is. But it wasn't the first time that there was something about his presence. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what we call the synoptic gospels, tell the transfiguration with an, an equal kind of amount of detail, with a few differences between them, but they all begin in the same way. About eight days. Now, whenever the gospels do that kind of thing, you say, what is the point of saying that if in fact it's not meant to mean anything? What the about eight days forces us to do is look over our shoulders to what happened eight days earlier. And the reference takes us back to when Jesus asked the disciples who were with him at that moment what people were saying about him. Who do people say I am? What are the people saying about my ministry, about my personhood? In response, Peter made his remarkable confession. Now, to me, this is one of those great crescendo moments in the music. When you go through the Gospels, and if you were to, to, to have the privilege of going through the Gospel and, and trying to mark it with music, this would be a huge crescendo. When, when Peter says, you are the Christ. God's Messiah. Now, linking that with what happens now is clearly important in the gospel writer's mind. And immediately Jesus leads them from such heights to what must have felt like the, the lowest of the depths when he says to them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. No, he must be killed. And on the third day, raised to life. You see, now the disciples are beginning to grasp that this walking with Jesus, this talking with Jesus, is no easy tread. It's going to involve suffering. It's going to involve rejection. And it's going to involve the death of a cross. 
So now transfiguration takes on a whole new concept because it's part of that journey to the cross. And it's part of our Lenten journey and our preparation for Easter. And the link between suffering and glory is a very interesting one. We too often want to put them in different sections of the library of our spirituality. We want to put them as though they don't have a link between the two, and they profoundly do. The distance between Good Friday and Easter Day is not merely a a, a reflection on the ministry of Jesus, but a description of what life is like. And so often our life is lived somehow in that intersection between those two experiences. Death and suffering, rejection, hurt, denial, and the risen Lord. In such a short space of time, the disciples' dreams must have been shattered. There are no incidents recorded in the Gospels between such a high moment of confession and the glory revealed on the mountainside. We can relate to this because so often that's what life is like. High moments, followed by by moments when our hopes are dashed and we're filled with disappointment. In the middle of our long nights, God brings us living hope. Dispirited lives can be renewed. In the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration, We sense uh, the confidence that this might have given to the disciples. They didn't understand it. They surely were going to come down and face all kinds of things. But they had a journey ahead of them to face. Maybe it enabled them to keep the instructions he had been giving them. The disciples kept this to themselves. Didn't tell anyone at that time what they'd seen. Secondly, this is the glory that calls for silence. There seems little opportunity to escape noise in our world. However, sometimes there are experiences and moments in our lives for which the only response is silence. We're brought to a place of silence at times by our experience of the presence of God. Because that experience is too expansive, it's too... and and this is a word I use very rarely because of its misuse today. It is so awesome that we are left struggling to find the words, but we don't have to find the words. There are also those moments that are so private. And I find it very interesting that in the ministry of Jesus, there were those times when when Jesus allowed an inner group of disciples into the privacy and intimacy of his presence. I find that most interesting. He knew how important that was. Doubtless the disciples were stunned by what they saw. For the gospel readers, uh, uh, we are told that there was a voice from heaven, very similar to the baptism, the bat call, the daughter of the voice. This is my beloved son. Glory somehow describes the the, the scene. As all house hunters know, location, location, location is so important. And here on this high mountain, you see its location. It is a mountain. And mountains are so important in the Bible. It was on a mountain that the law of God was given. It was on a mountain that the very prophet had challenged all the powers of darkness. And in a mountainside scene, God's glory is revealed. There are times which escape simple definition. What was there to say? What could any woman or man actually say in the presence of God? Just think of some of the human experiences which don't come anywhere near the deepest moments, but they leave us breathless. When you hold a newborn child for the first time, words are difficult. People who really are not actually as related come up with silly things like he looks like his dad. That's the last thing that a parent is thinking of. 
a parent is thinking of, thank God. Here in this moment, you're meeting me in a very human encounter. At the other end of the scale, one of the privileges and the, the difficult things to talk about has been the times in my life when I've sat with people who are passing over Jordan, who've come to the end of their lives, and inevitably you hold a man or woman's hand, you express prayers, you gather the loved one and the loved ones, then those difficult moments when the ones who haven't been very loving turn up. And yet you gather around in those moments and you know words somehow will not fill this moment completely. What can you say in the presence of the living God? Shouldn't surprise us that Luke tells us they kept silence, didn't tell others. Though it's more than of passing interest that when we turn later in the New Testament to the words of Second Peter, we read these words. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Now, if you can't see the link between A and B here, Ralph Harto writes, we know that serious things have to be done in silence. In silence, people love, pray, listen, compose, paint, write, think, and suffer. Too many of us are afraid of silence. We grow uncomfortable when, when a conversation stops. You, you'll have been in the setting, won't you, where a group of you are talking together and the conversation stops and then there's always the same guy or the same woman who steps in and feels the real task is to keep it going. And there are some times when it can stop to make sense of that moment. A moment that exceeds our understanding. A moment when we're in the presence of someone greater than ourselves. A moment when somehow we can hear the call of God. One writer suggests that the silence acknowledges the mystery of the event and the magnitude of its implications. It's interesting really that the gospel is a call to tell out. And yet somehow in the midst of the gospel accounts... Jesus at times in that what we know as the messianic secret, particularly in Mark, he says to them, don't tell anybody about this. But there are other times when they can't say anything about it. They're so stunned. And thirdly, this glory has multiple layers of meaning and it endures for all time. We live in a world that frequently wants to replicate those things that simply cannot be replicated. We do it because we're part of a culture which copies for its own benefit. I know that when in London the Wimbledon Tennis Championships happen, that every kid from everywhere is playing tennis the week after. And when it happens in Melbourne, it ain't any different. Because we like to try to replicate those things that you cannot replicate. It can't be captured by either mind or heart. All of us gain fresh and invigorating power by uncovering the multiple layers that you find in this account and applying them somehow to our lives. Mountains are, of course, metaphors of life. I, I've talked about their importance in the biblical sense, but we use the terminology in our everyday language. Seeking the summit can imply a quest to reach out for something very special, maybe even just beyond our perception. Seeking the summit can involve all kinds of risks. There are far too many examples of those who've lost their lives in the quest of something beyond them. And how can we avoid the words of Martin Luther King, who talked about having reached the mountaintop and have seen the promised land. See, mountains are so deep in meaning. 
one person in a need, a time of great need, offered this prayer. God grant me to be silent before you, that I may hear you, rest in you, that you may work in me, open to you, that you may enter me, empty before you, that you may fill me. Let me be still and know that you are my God. I began this address by asking whether glory is, is fleeting or enduring. What this inner circle of disciples experience on the mountainside is not a vision that would fade. Not that we should jump to the conclusion that they understood everything, but something that I am absolutely certain they would never forget. The three of them would have to face some of the most challenging of all experiences, giving their lives for that which Jesus Christ called them to. When we really have a vision of the glory of God, we begin to see his glory in everything around us. You see, what they see as the, as the face of Christ lights up is this vision of a God in the man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, is a glory that will now change the way they look at the world. Somehow from this moment, they will understand their own frailty, they'll understand God's presence, and they will know that every morning, as a song earlier uh, indicated to us, whatever God takes us on in all its twists and turns, every morning is fresh and new because of the glory of God. And so when we face the impossible circumstances of our lives, we wake and say, thank you, Lord, today, through your glory, I look out on the world with fresh imagination, new eyes, with a new perception of what you can and are doing in the world. When we deal with the intricate complexity of life and try to understand the link between faith and some of the deepest issues, God meets us there. And how we know this last one, when we're faced with the brokenness of the world, with all its hurt and hate, with those who, who choose to, to damage the weak and the vulnerable, when we try to understand all that, we realize that glory is so close to suffering. And here, thank God, suffering ultimately gives way to resurrection truth. In one sense, the glory of God is fully expressible, but its power to transform the world and transform your life is earth-shattering. May God grant us an enduring sense of the glory of God. Amen.